We're talking about momentum here at Walk Church and how we can have momentum, how the Lord springs forth momentum in our Christian walk, how we're not going backwards. Can I get an amen? We're not going backwards. Even right now, you might be tempted to think in the past. Don't allow, it says, take those thoughts captive and say, you know what, I'm not going backwards. So you got to let the past worry about the past. You got to let tomorrow worry about tomorrow. And right this moment, I want to encourage you to be present, to be locked in because I believe the Lord wants to give you a word from his word to help you experience the momentum he has for you. We've defined the word momentum with two words. We've taken a bunch of definitions for that word momentum. We've defined it with this, forward motion, that the Lord is the one who takes us forward. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not going backwards. I don't focus on the past. I strive ahead toward the goal, toward the prize, which is found in Christ. That's really what a walk is. A walk is taking your next step forward. And so there's three words that we've been unpacking when it comes to momentum. We started with family momentum, about joining a church family. Let me put these three statements on the screen, just doing a quick recap. Church is not an event you go to. Church is not a building you walk into. Church is a family of brothers and sisters adopted by God himself, placed into a church family, into an ecclesia, a body of believers who have been called out from this world, called out from their sin, called into a community of believers. So when we gather in here, we experience church, but we don't go to church. Church is a family that you belong to. Now, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm, and if, you, if you're not part of this church family, I want to encourage you to take that step and, and know who your family is. We want to know more about you. We want you to know more about us and our expectations on what does it mean to call walk family. So we've been talking about family momentum, and now we've been leaning into leadership momentum because here's what we really believe. I'll, I'll put this reality statement up on the screen. We believe every family member has leadership potential on their life. That means you and your mama too has leadership potential on their life. In fact, I want you to do something that is sometimes a little bit awkward. I'm an interactive preacher. It's just part of my personality. So you got to get a little uncomfortable at times during the sermon. I want you to find the person closest to you, and I want you to tell them you have leadership potential on your life. You have leadership potential on your life. And now hit the other side. Hit the other side. Say, I didn't forget about you. I didn't forget about you. You got leadership potential on your life. If you're online right now, put it in the comments section. Find some community in the comments. You have leadership potential on your life. If you're watching this on Instagram right now, you have leadership potential on your life. And we want you to experience all of it found in Jesus Christ. We've been, we've, been, we've, been, we've, we've been defining the word lead with an acronym. Because I believe if you're going to experience leadership momentum, you have to know what it means to be a leader. Now, there's a lot of different definitions on what leadership is and what leadership isn't. We're defining leadership at Walk Church by using a four-letter word, lead, and breaking it down word for word as an acronym. We'll put this up here on the screen, lead. Now, for those who have been with us, you're going to know some of these answers, and if you know them, I want you to shout them out loud and proud in the most godly way. Tell me what the L means. Leaders are learners. Leaders are learners. I love what Pastor Rick Warren says. He says, the minute you stop learning is the minute you stop leading. So leaders are not know-it-alls. If you walk into a room and somebody says, I'm the leader, you could like, that ain't the leader. (laughs) Because leaders are learners. Leaders are the ones that lean in with their notebook open. Leaders ask the best questions. Leaders take the best notes. Leaders don't just close it. They go revisit it. Leaders are constantly, passionately leaning into learning. That, that's how you lead, because here's what, you, what I've realized over the course. Of, you can't give what you don't have. So you, you, you got to be learning in order to lead. We lead out of the capacity of what Christ has taught us through our sitting at his feet. 
Jesus once walked in this house, there was two sisters, Mary and Martha. Martha said, leaders are busy. <laughs> leaders are cleaning. Leaders are, are, are dusting. Leaders are making sure everything is, is right. And not that those things are not right because leaders are excellent, but before they're excellent, they're learning. Mary sits down at the feet of Jesus and says, I'm here to learn. The leader is in the room. And Martha gets upset and says, how come she's not helping me? And here's what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't shade what Martha's doing. He just says, Mary made the better choice, which was to learn from me. Leaders are learners. Let me give you the E. The E is? Excellent. Leaders are excellent. I love Daniel chapter 6. The book of Daniel talks about one of the greatest leaders that the Bible speaks to. His name was Daniel. Out of all the people in the Bible, there was only one that was sinless. His name was Jesus. Amen. Everybody else was sinful. Everybody else had a flaw. But here's what I will tell you. It's hard to find one on Daniel. In, in his big book, the book of Daniel is a very important book in the, in the context of the Old New Testament. There's very little about Daniel that was not excellent. And because of that, he got promoted to be above the governors when it came to leading in a land that was actually led by a pagan ruler king named Darius who actually came to put his faith in the God of Daniel. You know why Darius put his faith in the God of Daniel? Because Daniel had such an excellence about him yeah. that he was like, dude, what is it about you? Even the lions respected Daniel's excellence. Come on. I don't know if that's actually a legitimate statement. I just know that when Daniel was thrown into the lions, then the lions hung out with him. It was, it was God's doing, by the way. The Lord was in that place. Daniel walked by faith, and God sustained him even through that miraculous moment uh, with the lions. It was after that that Darius said, we got to believe in this guy's God. It said that Daniel carried an excellent spirit. Some translations would interpret that word spirit to attitude. To have a spirit, it's an attitude. Daniel had an excellent attitude. Leaders lead from a posture of excellence. This sermon that I preached on leaders are excellent really hit me because you know, one morning I, I, I woke up, I'm feeling good today, I'm going to be a leader, and I walked in my closet, and it didn't feel excellent. <laughs> it felt like a tornado hit it. Anybody ever, uh, okay, it's just me, all right, y'all are, y'all are great. Um, and so I said, I got to start here, I got to start first, this is my first step. And I was working on that closet, getting it excellent. Then I walked into my car, and I said, man, this is a church planner's car right here. This is, this is wild, this is all types of stuff in this car. And you know what I realized? A leadership takeaway I'm going to give you right now. I had to do something. It was really a big deal. Here's what it was. I had to throw things away. <laughs> Come on, somebody say throw it away. <laughs> somebody say throw it away. <laughs> now, maybe you're above this point, but I realized, you know what? I, there's just some stuff I had to throw away. In order to get to a place of excellence, there's just some stuff that you're not going to wear again. Well, give it away. <laughs> there's some stuff that you're not going to eat again throw it away. There's some stuff that, you know what, that was good a season ago, but you're moving into a new season. You got momentum on your life. You got to step into it and you might have to let some stuff go. I want to encourage you to be excellent. Third point, the A stands for aware. Leaders have great awareness. They're aware of themselves first. We talked last week about self-awareness. Self -aware. There's nothing worse than a leader who's not aware. And if you can read the Bible, great. Praise God. Just make sure you can read the room that you're in too. Read the people that you're around. Read the energy. Read the mood. Read the vibes. Read the times. John the Baptist was a great leader. You know why? Because he knew who he was and he knew who he wasn't. John the Baptist stepped on the scene. They said, oh, you're the Messiah. He said, no, I'm not. And they said, oh, you're Elijah. He said, no, I'm not. They said, oh, so you must be the prophet. And he said, wrong again. He was greatly aware of who he wasn't. And they said, well, who are you? He said, I'm a voice. Crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way for King Jesus. And then when Jesus stepped on the scene, all of John's disciples began to follow Jesus. And he said, this is why I was created, to point people to him. Great leaders know who they are. Great leaders know who they are not. And can I just tell you, there's nobody more aware than Jesus there's nobody more excellent than Jesus. Even Jesus, although he had infinite wisdom and knowledge, the Bible even says he grew in wisdom and stature. So even though he 
did know everything, he still modeled learning. That even at 12 years old, Jesus was found hanging with the teachers. Jesus had such a tight-knit, close relationship with the Father. He modeled this abiding relationship with him. If you want to know what abiding looks like, look at Jesus' life and how he abided in the Father. And how the Father expressed his works through his Son, leaders are learners. Leaders are excellent. Leaders are aware. They're self-aware. They're spirit-aware. They're aware of what the Holy Spirit's doing. They're sin-aware. They're aware that sin would love to take leaders out. Every year, we're seeing a a compiled list of leaders who are falling. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And and, and one of the reasons why is because they just weren't watchful. They just lacked boundaries. I remember once reading a statistic where over 200 pastors were interviewed who had a fallen moral failure. And all 200 of them said the same thing. They said, we all thought it could never happen to us. You weren't aware. I'll tell you what, sin has no favorites. Sin is crouching on every one of our doors and would love to destroy our lives. Satan is a schemer. It says that we need to stand firm in Christ, against the schemes. The word scheme is the English word method. It's, it's schisma. It's methodia. It's where he, it's, the devil has these different methods he tries to pull to trip you up. Be aware. Leaders are aware. And now we're ready to move into this final letter, the D there of lead. Are you ready? If you're ready, say ready. ready. Come on, let me give a, get a drum roll, please. Drum roll. Leaders are disciplined. Come on disciplined. Leaders are disciplined. I heard a lot of different D words that could have really very easily made it into this last point. Except somebody said destroyer, and that didn't make sense. Somebody was like, I know what it is. And I was like, I don't think it's destroyer. I don't think leader. I was like, leaders are... Um, yeah, we're destroying the kingdom of darkness. Amen. I like it. Uh, leaders are disciplined. All right. Leaders are disciplined. Well, here's what happened. When we looked at all the other D words that could have fit there, we realized those things won't happen if discipline doesn't first happen. So I want to encourage you today that these four characteristics are best lived out in the Son of God. We didn't get this leadership model from a business book. Not that business leadership books are bad. We didn't get this from an entrepreneur or a self-help or a motivator or a leadership magazine. We didn't do that. We looked at the Son of God. Said, what are four characteristics of Christ that he models? Learners, excellent, aware, and disciplined. I believe because Jesus was disciplined, we should be too. Let me just say that one more time. Because Jesus was the most disciplined leader to ever walk this earth, therefore we should be disciplined as well. Let me give you a definition for the word discipline. In fact, I'm going to give you three. Discipline, it's the Greek word paideia. Paideia, you'll find it all over the New Testament and the Old Testament as well, speaks to this topic of discipline. And when it comes to leadership, it's very important. It's educating or training by implication, disciplinary correction. I read a quote from John Maxwell where he said, the reason why most people are not disciplined is because it's hard. Simple. Can I just tell you it's hard to be disciplined? It's easy to be in the lazy river. It's easy to not have any discipline to your life and just do whatever your emotions tell you to do. Do whatever your feelings tell you to do. Eat whatever your mind wants you to eat. Feel however you want to feel. Don't be disciplined. Discipline requires correction. Sometimes it's just you correcting yourself. Ever had a thought you didn't like and you thought, I shouldn't think that? Ever made a decision you shouldn't do and say, I shouldn't? Ever wish you could have like a rewind button, like, I want to put that back, that that phrase that I said so quick, I want to put that back? Discipline requires correction. Discipline is the practice of training. Now, some of you are saying right now, practice? (laughs) Come on, my sports fans. Practice? Discipline requires practice. And a lot of times, Allen Iverson gets a lot of shade for that quote, but he was one of the most disciplined athletes in his day. The practice of training, it's getting better. It's 
training yourself, training your body. It's the practice of putting in work. It's the ability to control yourself. Now, maybe this is a revelation for you, but God wants you to control yourself. In the context of Christianity, self-control matters. Leaders are self-aware. Leaders are self-controlled. Now, watch this. When you become a believer and follower of Jesus, one of the good news of the gospel is that he gives you his helper, which is his spirit. The Holy Spirit begins to invade the believer's life. The Holy Spirit takes over your heart, your mind, your whole life. He begins to control you in a such a way where you become a new creation, says the Bible. The old is gone, the new has come. And then fruit begins to pop out of your life. You become a new person. Now, some of the fruit that comes out of the new creation is love. You become more loving. Kindness, all of a sudden you become kinder. Gentle, you become more gentle in your approach, in your walk. Patient, you become more patient like Christ. And one of those is actually self-control. Or maybe you were out of control. When the Holy Spirit invades your life, you become more self-controlled. In other words, you become more disciplined. I want to talk to you about why discipline matters today, and I want to give you three areas that you can focus on being a more disciplined leader. One of the reasons why it matters, I'm going to give you a reality statement. I want you to write this down. Come on, leaders or learners, write this down. Discipline dictates destiny. Yeah. Yeah. Not enough people writing. Okay, come on, stay with me. Hey, I want to give away journals today. If you want a journal, you can go to our merch area and just say, hey, I need a journal. Pastor Hyden told me leaders are learners. Give me a journal. We'd love to bless you with one, okay? We got two different types. We got one with a pen. We got one without a pen. Whatever one you want today, the journals are free, all right? Don't go get one right now because I don't want you to miss it. <laughs> but get one at some point, Okay. Discipline dictates destiny. In other words, your destination will be involved with your discipline. Lack of discipline dictates destiny. I can tell you a lot about your future by your disciplines today. I can tell you what your destiny could look like just by studying your disciplines today. One of the practices that I would encourage you to do is continue to lean into the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a good discipline to help you grow in wisdom. But Proverbs chapter 5 has this chunk toward the ends of Proverbs 5. Every month I read Proverbs 5 and it gives me that like punch right in the chest. Let me show it to you. Proverbs chapter 5. We'll kick it off in verse 21. It says, A man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths. Isn't that a cool verse right there? That the Lord, the Lord watches you. That all of your ways are before the eyes of the Lord. You never pull a fast one on God. There's never a moment where you look back and you're like, oh, God's watching me. 24-7, he's God, he's able to do that. He po- How about God is even pondering? Why did you do that? God's even pondering your ways. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. In other words, the iniquities will trip you up. They'll catch you in a trap. You're held fast in the cords of your sin. Why do we want to be aware of sin? Because it wants to hold you. It wants to kidnap you. It wants to, wants to put you in cords. Be aware of that trap. Verse 23, it says, He dies for a lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. One thing about your destiny that I don't want for you is for you to die for a lack of discipline. I don't want you to die because you didn't have the disciplines in place to reach your capacity. I said it. Every person in this room has leadership potential. How your discipline is will determine if you reach it or not. If you have the disciplines in place to reach your potential, you'll get there. If not, a lack of discipline will lead to the death of a dream. Some of you have a, have a book in your heart. The reason why it didn't come alive yet is because you weren't disciplined. Some of you might have a whole notepad of songs. You ever met somebody? They're like, check out all these songs I got in my phone. I'm like, why don't you bring them to life? Ever met somebody who said, oh, man, I should be in the NBA. <laughs> I've known a lot of people like that. Discipline. 
Maybe you had a business idea. Maybe you had an entrepreneur idea. Maybe you had a leadership goal. Oh, I want to be this person. Your discipline will dictate your destiny. Leaders are disciplined. I love this quote from a guy by the name of Vance Havner. He was a pastor revivalist. He says, the alternative to discipline is disaster. So you choose, walk church. Which direction do you want to go? I want to talk to you about this subject of discipline. I was, I was reading this quote earlier from a great leadership guru named Zig Ziglar. Yeah. Great name. Uh, Zig Ziglar from Dallas, great uh, leadership believer. Uh, Zig Ziglar talks about how it's, it's leadership that takes you the distance. He says, it was character that got us out of bed, commitment that moved us into action, and discipline that enabled us to follow through. So maybe you got out of bed today. Maybe you're ready for the game. It's discipline that's going to see you through. So are you ready to go into these points? If you're ready, say ready. Ready. If you're hungry, say let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. Father, right now as we talk about discipline, discipline our minds to focus. Discipline our hearts to be locked in. Help us to be still before you and help us to catch these principles and then live them out. We need your help, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me give you these three T words. We'll start with this first T word, disciplined in your time. Leaders are disciplined, and one of the areas that leaders are disciplined in, remember the definitions, it's a controlled pattern. It's a self awareness, it's correction, it's making the right decisions, it's training. I was watching an interview on Kobe Bryant recently. Kobe had this crazy disciplined schedule. I wake up at 4.30, I hit the gym, I eat a very disciplined breakfast, I'm back doing weights, then I do my treatment, then I shoot a thousand jumpers, and then I wake my kids up. I'm like, what? (laughs) Different. Discipline. Time management is powerful. How we spend our time matters. Come on, everybody has 24 hours in a day, amen? Amen. Nobody has more time or a secret uh, hack on time. It's just how we spend it. I love this leadership quote from J. Oswald Sanders. He writes the book Spiritual Disciplines. If you want a copy of this book, come to the lead class on the fourth Sunday in November. We're going to give it to all the people that attend. He says, minutes and hours wisely used translate into an abundant life. If you spend your minutes and you spend your hours wisely, let me dictate your destiny. It'll lead to an abundant life. Now, this principle was first taught in the Bible. You'll see it all over the Proverbs. You'll see it in the life of Jesus. But I love how the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul writes, and he is closing out his letter. He's getting to the finish of his letter. He's writing to the Ephesians on now how to live. The the first three chapters of Ephesians, all about upward, our identity in Christ. The next three chapters of Ephesians is now the walk. How do we live out our identity in Christ? The position to the practical, right? Here's what he says. In fact, let's read it together. Ready, set, go. Look carefully then how you walk. Hold on a second. Tell the person next to you, this is a verse for you. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. God wants you to make the best use of the time he's given you. For some reason, I can't tell you all the reasons why, but I know for some reason he decided to wake you up. I can't tell you all the reasons why. He's got a lot of reasons. Are you aware? For some reason, God wanted you to wake up today. God wanted to make sure that your heart was beating. God wanted to make sure that your lungs were working. God wanted to make sure that your brain was able to be intact today. God wanted to use you today. He wanted to speak to you today. He wants you to make the best use of the time. He's the Lord of the time. Jesus was greatly aware of the time. He would actually tell people, he'd say, it's not my time. My time is coming. Then Jesus would know when to rise from the grave. Jesus would know when to ascend into heaven. Jesus knows when is the right time to come back. 
He's following the Father's will for his life. He and the Holy Spirit are all working together, and he is an on-time God. Amen? Amen. Now, will we be an on-time leader? (laughs) That is the question. Making the best use of the time. How you spend your time matters. You've got to get disciplined with your time. I want to encourage you because somebody's watching your life. And somebody's watching how you spend your time. If the Lord watching is not enough motivation, your kids are watching. If it's not your kids, it's your coworkers. If it's not your coworkers, it's probably because you put everything on social media. Somebody's watching your life. How you spend your time matters. Let me give you one more verse. Colossians chapter 4, Paul writes to the church in Colossae. He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. How are you ever going to reach somebody on the outside if you're not leading first on the inside? making disciplined decisions on how to maximize the time that God has given you. Oh, friend, let me just encourage you to do that. Make the best use of the time. God might put you in front of somebody today. One of the reasons why I've made the devoted decision over the years to start my day in the Word of God is because I don't want to hear another voice until I hear the one who made me, until I hear the one who created me, until I hear the one who woke me up on purpose, So I always go to the book of Proverbs every single morning to start off, and I don't finish there. I try to have a continual pattern of hearing God throughout the day, and friend, you'll hear him clearest through his word. God speaks. There's 66 books. Nobody's mastered the book. There's more for you to eat from. And I want to encourage you because I've found that there's oftentimes where God gives me a word in the morning that I can give to an outsider in the day. That principle, let me say it again. You can't give what you don't have. So why is it important for you to walk in wisdom in the morning? Because you might be in an Uber and somebody might need a word. You ever came up across somebody that was just hungry? And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about here's an outsider dropped right in front of one of God's children looking for bread spiritually to eat, starving for some wisdom. You got anything to give? Were you with God that day that you can then depart something that he gave you? God, if God gave you something, it's because he wants to give it to somebody. God is a generous God. That nugget of wisdom is oftentimes for somebody you're going to meet that day. Apply it in your own life, but be ready to share it. But so often we got nothing to share. Because we're not making the best use of the time. One of the greatest convictions of our generation is the smartphone time percentage reminder. Come on. (laughs) Anybody ever get those? Or we probably are. You probably turned them off. You're like, I don't want to even know. Don't even tell me that I spent 14 hours on my phone. (laughs) Right? Can I just submit to you this? I don't know that I've ever. I'm trying to think of a moment where I've spent a chunk of time scrolling on social media and left that moment encouraged. I can tell you probably a ton of times where I did that and left that moment distracted, discouraged, or with an unwanted feeling to compare to someone or something else that made me feel less valued. And you know what I tend to think? I could have used that time better. And so many of us are starting our... I once heard it put out, if you win the morning, you'll win the day. I don't know if that's exactly true, but I think there's some of it that's true. Listen to me. If you start off with the word, if you start off with a devo, if you start off downloading from God, that's a battery pack right there. That's a charge right there. Don't lead on empty. Leaders are disciplined. I need wisdom today. Listen to me. Oh, catch this point. Do not get your wisdom from dings and alerts and notifications on your phone. Do not get your wisdom from CNN, MSNBC, Fox 5, whatever news station that you like. It doesn't compare to the wisdom that he gives. 
If that's the wisdom that you're getting, that's the wisdom that you're giving. And that's why you want to talk about things that really, at the end of the day, don't stack up to the things that he wants. I'm not saying that other things don't matter. I'm saying have their placement. Be disciplined. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. This watching world around is watching the church of Jesus Christ, looking to see if we have anything to give. For far too long, the church hasn't had anything to give. Shoot, we hardly ever see outsiders. You ever look around? You know that our city is 90% unchurched? It means 90% of our city, 2 million people care less about what we're doing right now. What if you had something to give? What if you had a discipline about you where you just began to be the light of the city, the light of the workplace, the light of the school? Now, now there's conflict. The darkness doesn't like the light. But the light is attractional. You don't got to advertise light. But I was reading some some wild report from NASA about how far you can go up and still see Las Vegas because the light shines that bright. Come on, church. We're the light of the world. Christ is the light in us. Walk wisely by making the best use of the time that God has given you. So I don't know what that looks like. Maybe you need to rearrange your schedule, but maybe today you would say, you know what? That means I got to wake up earlier. That means that if I'm going to wake up earlier, i got to go to sleep earlier. Do you know what you're talking about? That's a discipline conversation. <laughs> That's a discipline conversation. Maybe you're saying, hey, you know what? i got to cut out. Maybe you don't have to binge watch the whole season in one night. <laughs> Why don't you stretch that mug out? <laughs> right? Maybe you shouldn't watch it at all. You ask the question, is it excellent? Hey, we're finishing up the leadership component here today. We're going to keep leaning into it all throughout our church, but the sermon series on leadership ends today, so I'm going to be talking about awareness. I'm going to talk about excellence. I'm going to talk about learning. I'm going to talk about discipline. They all work together. I want you to see, Pastor Mike, give me a chair real quick. Can I get a chair real quick? Thanks, Pastor Mike. Let me get a quick chair. I just want you to just see this for a second. Now, this is a chair right here. This, is, this chair has four legs on it, all right, four-legged chair. Now, listen, I want you to think about leadership like this chair. Each leg matters. Leaders are learners. Leaders are excellent. Leaders are aware. Leaders are disciplined. If you take one of those legs off, it's hard to sit in this chair. In fact, it looks really weird. In fact, you're going to actually feel like, man, I, I wish I had another leg. You need all four leadership legs to become the leader that God's called you to be. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Amen. I want to encourage you to make the best use, the best use of the time. Let me move into point number two. I get so pumped about these points. Point number two, leaders are disciplined in their time. Leaders are disciplined in their talent. Discipline with the talent he's given you. Everybody in this room, listen to me. You have talent, right? You have talent. My, bu my buddy Smitty said, that's right. He's, he's a talented tattoo artist. Man, your work is great, brother. Talented. So many of you, Nina has a talent in how she works with kids. It is a talent God has given you. Sometimes I sit back and watch how you interact. I don't know how you do it the way that you do it. I'm learning from you, but you have an incredible talent. Pastor Mike, you have an incredible talent when it comes to business and administration. You're a leader of leaders. You're able to do math in your head quickly. I get overwhelmed quickly, right? Different people in this room have different talents all over the place. My brother Janoy plays the Congo drums. You got to hear him at some point. He's talented, amen? Come on. I want to, uh, that's coming, all right? So much talent in the room. If I, my brother Mario is a talented pool guy, amen? Come on. And, hey, look, he knows what he's doing. I trust him, right? There, I, if I could just, there's, this room is loaded with talent. Oh my goodness. I, gotta, I, I don't want to dominate the sermon, but I can start calling out the talent in all of you. Some of you may not be aware of it, but what you do with that talent matters. There was once a high school coach who's made this statement. He said, hard work beats talent when, y'all know it, talent doesn't work hard. 
Hard work beats talent. When talent doesn't, I was actually with somebody just this past week. We were exchanging basketball stories. Person asked me about my basketball journey. I was able to share about stuff that I did in high school, stuff that I did in college, stuff that I did professionally, stuff that I did collegiately in coaching. I was able to ask him, and it wasn't like a right or wrong thing. I'm just using this point. The person just said to me, you know what, man? Like, I hooped in high school, but I didn't hoop. And I was like, what you mean? Like, I, like I played, but, I, man, I, I wish I would have actually played, like, for the team. But I wasn't disciplined. Discipline separates. Excellence separates. Discipline is the difference between good and great. Discipline is the difference between average to good. In order to reach your destiny and the goal that you have for your life, maybe you want this year to look different. Maybe you want 2023 to be better than 2022. That's a good goal to have. It's only going to happen if you're disciplined. If you're doing the same patterns, that's going to be the same potential. But if you get disciplined with your talent, oh, you'll make a difference. I was reading about this principle uh, in the book of Proverbs today. Anybody read Proverbs 30 today? Don't feel like you have to answer that. But I saw Noah shoot his hand up. I like it, Noah. I was in Proverbs 30 this morning. I didn't dare want to think I was wise enough to go into this Sunday not having read the Word. I'm not. I need to download from the Word daily, don't you? So I wanted to get in there today. Lord, speak to me. Now, Proverbs 30 is a bizarre chapter, but there's wisdom in it. There's wisdom in even how to discipline with your talent. Let me show you these verses out of Proverbs chapter 30. Check this out. Verse 24, four things on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. You ready? The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. You know what I learned about ants today? They're disciplined. Come on, we got we to eliminate the excuse-making mentality. Leaders, listen to me. Leaders, listen to me. Come on, lean in, leaders. You got to eliminate the excuse. Nobody feels sorry for you. Nobody feels sorry for you. In fact, most people don't care. Ants. Ants realized nobody feels sorry for us. Little ants are teaming up together, recognizing we small. We are not strong. But... If we get disciplined, we'll provide food for the summer. Ants are strategic. Ants are wise. Ants are disciplined. So here's what ants do with their little ant teeth. They pick up a little grain of food, and they store it up. And then they go back, and they get a little piece of food, and they store it up. And in the summer, they eat. Learn from the ants today. Come on. They are aware Ants are aware. You know why? Ants are not trying to be snakes. Ants are like, snakes got to do what snakes got to do. We ants, we got to do what we got to do. It would be a weird for an ant to be like, man, I, I, I wish I was a dog. You're not a dog. You're an ant. But they're eating. Verse 26, the rock badgers. Come on, when's the last time you gave a shout out to a rock badger? What is a rock badger? The rock badgers are a people. They are not mighty, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. Do you know how much strategic, detailed thinking it takes to make your home on a cliff? Rock badgers know how to do it. Rock badgers are a people. Sometimes the church feels like, are we a people? Are we a unit? Rock badgers are working together. They're getting those trees and logs, and they're building their homes right there in places that you couldn't do it. Rock badgers are doing it disciplined. Let me give you the next verse. Verse 27, the locusts have no king. The locusts are not like, oh God, give us a king. The locusts are like, hey, we don't got a king, but we march in rank. You ever seen an army or some type of uh, musicians or whatever that may be, choreography, march in rank? You know, it takes a lot of discipline to march in rank. Locusts do it. How about the lizard? You can take lizards in your hands, yet it's in king's places. Lizards are like, you know what? Can't catch me. You can't get in the king's palace, but I can. I bet you lizards have little homes that they've made like in the, 
in the king's palaces, living good. Here's, here's the point that I'm, that I'm trying to make. I'm trying to learn from the Proverbs today. Let me go to the first verse. Let, look, look back at this beginning part, right? These things are small, but they're wise. I'm sorry. They're, they're small, but they're exceedingly wise. You determine what type of wise you want to be. Do you want to just be regular wise? I want to be exceedingly wise. Be that type of leader. Learn from the ants. Learn from the rock badgers. Get disciplined. Stop making excuses. Stop blaming everybody else. Come on. You might have a rough story, but how about you be the change that you didn't have? We got to get out of the excuse mentality, and we got to get out of the kind of mentality. Y'all know what the kind of is? Hey, you going to be a leader this year? I'm kind of. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Kind of. You ever been baptized? Well, kind of. Are you saved? Kind of. Eliminate the kind of. Are you, do you eat healthy? Kind of. It's like, you got to just, you got to make a choice. Are you disciplined? Kind of. You're not. I'm not, you know, just be like, are, hey, are you, are you excellent? Well, I'm kind of, I, you know, we love to talk. We love to talk. This is the year to do it, <laughs> to have momentum. I, I love when people in our church win. I love when you invite me to the grand opening of your business. I love when you invite me to the grand opening of your barbershop. I love when you get a promotion. I love when you go to the next level. I love when you move from a brown belt to a black belt, and I, get, and I want to be at that ceremony. I love when you have a presentation, a show at your school. You're a great violinist. You're, you're an incre- You have talent. Maximize your talent. Brother, sister, I want to encourage you to, to, to get disciplined in your talent and watch what God will do. When you're disciplined in your talent, your discipline will speak for itself. I love this quote from the greatest coach of college basketball, the winning is coach, John Wooden. Here's what coach John Wooden says. Discipline yourself and others won't need to. Is that not a great word? Yeah. Does anybody like being disciplined? No. But if you can discipline yourself, other people will stop worrying about you. You can just be the disciplined leader. Oh, that's going to be an example to set. You got to ask yourself this. This is something I want you to ask yourself. Not right now, later. Ask yourself, do you love discipline? Do you love it? This is something that's convicted me recently. Let me give you one more proverb. I'm loading you up with Proverbs today. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. Memorize this verse. Proverbs 12, 1. If you're ready, say ready. ready. Come on, read this with me. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. I remember I sent this to a basketball coach friend of mine. He's like, that's in the Bible? Now listen, especially spouses, do not weaponize this verse. Don't pull it out and psh. I told you you were stupid. Don't do that. Be disciplined. Be aware. Be kind. Whoever loves discipline. I read this verse every 12th of a month, I start out, sometimes I don't read all of Proverbs 12 because I get stuck on verse one. <laughs> uh, Proverbs 12, one, whoever loves discipline, hey, pay the credit card off, pay your car off, make moves this year, get disciplined this year. If you got to say no to a good thing to say yes to a great thing, say it through discipline. Amen. If you got you got to love it. I had to start praying for this. Lord, I don't love discipline, but I want to. Lord, help me to love discipline. Help me to love correction. Help me not to hate correction. Can I tell you that? Like, like I'm reading a book right now. And this book talks about how we should really lead with encouragement and I think we should because people need to be encouraged. But one of the arguments the author makes, he says, we should lead with encourage because people hate correction. But I found it's co- through correction that we grow. It's through correction that we grow in discipline. It's through correction that we grow in wisdom. 
It's through correction that we get better. In fact, I've learned to love correction. I've learned to love discipline. That's not easy. It's not ever easy to hear about an area that needs to get better. But friend, what's better than getting better? Grow. It's actually what the Bible would call stupid to hate reproof. So if somebody gives you a reproof, this is for Walk Church. I'm not going to speak for every other church. But I want us to set a culture here at Walk Church where we actually reprove each other. What the Bible calls is admonishment. It says that we should admonish each other. What does admonish mean? Lovingly correct one another. And we should, be, we should have hearts that are the soil of receptivity because we have great reasons to be humble. Because we've all been forgiven of so much. We've all been loved greatly. None of us have a reason for any even sniff of self-righteousness. None of us should have any type of Phariseeism in us where we walk into the room and think we're better than one another. This is a hospital for broken people to find healing. I'm glad we don't tell the doctors that. Doctor, don't tell me what's wrong. No, doctor, tell me what's wrong. I want to get better. I'll love you for that. It takes discipline. It takes discipline. Let me give you this, this math equation. We're almost done. Talent plus discipline equals excellence. Amen? If you want to be excellent, if you want to be excellent, come on, Will. If you want to be excellent in the gym, you got to be disciplined. You, you, you got to put the work in. You can't skip leg day. Come on, amen? You, you got to go for it. This is what all the weightlifters always tell me, right? Come on. I'm like, ah, we don't, you know, we, arms one day, other arm the other day, chest the next day, shoulders the next day. That's the whole week. Don't skip leg day. Full body. Talent plus discipline equals excellence. Like, don't be like, man, I'm, I'm really working on my prayer life, so I'm avoiding the Bible. No. I'm working on all of it. I'm praying. I'm reading. Hey, do this. Put your phone charger, plug it in in a place where you have to go underneath your bed to get it. So that means you got to get on your knees in order to grab it. And then you start, you start your day upward. God, I need you. Let me give you the third T. Third T and we're almost done. I promise you, this is it. No extra T's. Time, talent, treasure. Leaders are disciplined with their treasures. Leaders are disciplined with the things God has given you. Any parents you ever given your kids something and you're like, hey, be careful with that. I gave you that. Discipline with the treasures God has given you. Let me just tell you, God has given you your time. God has given you your talent. God has given you your treasure. Every resource that God has given you is, is a gift that came from above. The book of James says, every good gift comes from above. In fact, one of the staggering realities of the Bible is that the book tells us that everything we have now will belong to somebody else someday. So don't get too attached to your possessions because they'll leave you. <laughs> they'll cheat on you. The book of Proverbs says that a wise person stores up treasures and, and riches for his children's children. So you're not just thinking about your kids, you're thinking about your kids' kids. That's wisdom. I want to encourage you when it comes to your finances to hold it loosely. Don't cling to it, but even trust God with your treasure, the things that God has given you even your home, even your riches, even your finances, to say, God, this is yours first. What does this look like for me to steward well? I'm a steward. I'm going to be disciplined with my money. If you're not, your money will lead you. And that's the question. You can, am I leading my money or is my money leading me? And I'll tell you this, money is a bad leader. Money is a bad leader. Don't, don't allow 
your dollars to lead your life. I, I read this verse in, in Proverbs in 23. It's an interesting verse. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. It will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. Can I get an amen from somebody? I know it's hard to amen that, but it's true. Anybody ever get paid and then you check your bank account like an hour later and it's just like, what happened? How? How? Literally just sprouted wings and flew away into somebody else's bank account, whether that's a bill, whether that's a mortgage, whether that's a car payment, whether you hit on the sneakers app, I don't know what it is. But that thing will, fl- I mean, you better make sure you really want those shoes. That money's coming out. Jeez. Sprouts wings, gone. And then, you, then, you, then you're just left to think, Lord, did I even pray about that? Lord, was I disciplined with that? Lord, did I manage that well? John Maxwell says it like this. He He gives a great word on discipline. He says, small disciplines repeated with consistency every day lead to great achievements gained slowly over time. Small disciplines repeated consistently. Here's one one consistent practice that I would submit to you today. To trust the Lord when it comes to tithing. I want to give you this practice This is not an agenda-driven plug for our church. I don't know everybody's tithing statements and records. It's, it's, It's not something that I'm interested in as much as I'm interested in you being disciplined in the areas God's called you to be disciplined in when it comes to finances. Is tithing commanded in the New Testament? I don't necessarily see it as a command in the New Testament, I see tithing as the first step of generosity in the whole lens of the Bible. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, the biblical pattern for generosity has always started with tithing. If you look back at Abraham all the way up, even Jesus commends the Pharisees for the practice of tithing. It's the disciplined principle that says, God gave me 100%. I'm going to carve out 10%. I'm going to trust him with that, and he'll do the rest. That is what the principle is. If you do that over time, it will become less and less burdensome. It'll become more and more joyful. It becomes worship. It becomes, God, I even worship you with my giving. It becomes, God, I even give you with, I I give you back the stuff you gave me, and I'm glad to do it. And I've found people that, All right, so I can say this now because we got a little bit more depth on us. In other words, you know, I used to say this in the first couple years of our church, and it was like, well, you don't have a great amount of data. Well, listen, in seven years of church planting, and even the two leading up where we were gathering our team and planning and praying and all that stuff, in our journey, and Nina, correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor Mike, Elsie as well, I don't think I've ever met somebody who's been faithful in their tithing that's ever been in need. I've seen a lot of benevolence requests come in. I've seen a lot of people who have been in need and even pray, ask for prayer. Pr- man, pray for me, man. My financial situation is all jacked up. And I'll lovingly say this, not out of agenda. I say, how are you doing with tithing? Not because you need to tithe, et cetera, but because I want to see if you're trusting God in this area because when you trust him in the area, he always comes through. Every time, people go, ah, I ain't doing that. Every time, I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. How can you hold God accountable to something, come through, when you're not holding yourself accountable to do what he asked you to do? Tithing invites faith. If you say, you know what, I won't be able to tithe because I won't be able to X, Y, and Z. Either A, your X, Y, and Z is not disciplined. Maybe you're living beyond your means. You need to reevaluate. Or you just lack faith. (laughs) Trusting God with the 10% invites God to move in the faith realm for that 10%. And man, the stories are wonderful. I mean, Nina and I just had a story just recently about how God moved in a miraculous way 
to provide in ways that we totally were unexpected. I just told a brother this past week in Reno. I was like, bro, how did God put it on your heart? I said, man, God put it on my heart to do that. I said, for real? God puts stuff on people's heart when we trust him. I can't give you the recipe other than trust him. But listen, only you know if you do or not. That's up to you and him. But I want to encourage you, it's good. It, it is good to be disciplined in your finances and let God take care of the rest because he's big enough to take care of it. Amen. Leaders are generous. Leaders don't let their money hold them. They hold their money and they give it. Come on, worship team, help me close this sermon out. I'm going to pray. Um, final recap. Uh, we should be disciplined because Jesus is worthy of our discipline. So be disciplined in your time. He gave you time. Be disciplined in your talents. He gave them to you. And be disciplined in the treasures God has given you for the season that God's given you. Make him known through these things. And I really believe you'll be glad you did. And in the moment that you fail, how about this? You land on a bed of grace. When you miss it on the discipline, praise God for grace. When you miss it on the tithe, guess what? Grace. When you miss it on using your talent, grace. But I will say this. Come on, there's a lot of promises in God's word, isn't there? But one thing God never promised us was that he would make up for our lack of discipline. So today's a great day to start. Today's a great day to say, God, I trust you. I'm ready to be disciplined. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this sermon. I know I needed it. And I believe somebody needed it too. So I pray for those online. I pray for those in the room. And God, if there's somebody here right this moment that needs to just stop and receive you as Savior, I pray they would. With their heart, with their mind, with their hands, they would say, Jesus, come into my life and radically change me. Come on, would you pray that with me right now? Just say, Lord, I receive you. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the grave. I receive you into my life, into my heart, into all of me. I repent of my past. I repent of my sins. Help me to be disciplined. Thank you for grace. I love you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.